What are the themes of the movie? Forgiveness, romance, revenge. Paris Hilton. All right, we went with like the the purple ambiance today. So like in my head, the top of my head is not pink. There's like light bulbs that are a different color. It's it's just the vibe, okay? Oh my God, we're finally kind of back on time for videos. This actually released on Christmas Day theatrically, but it just released on the 15th on VOD. So I think I'm okay. So I actually saw Promising Young Woman for the first time a year ago at the Sundance Film Festival. It was one of the ones our group was anticipating quite a bit, written and directed by Emerald Fennell, starring Carrie Mulligan, had Bo Burnham, who I'm always down to see in the film world after eighth grade, and it was produced by Margot Robbie's production company. I ended up making it into the showing just in time with my dear friend Arturo Zarita from the Let Me Explain channel. And I remember looking over at him as the finale started playing out, absolutely shocked by what I was watching. This movie is loaded with bubblegum pop, candy coated imagery, fuzzy pink sweaters, floral patterns that peel away to this seedy, visceral reality that our main character is living through as the story builds to its conclusion. The complete non-spoiler rundown is that Promising Young Woman tells the story of Cassie, a med school student who dropped out following a tragedy and her inability to deal with the grief of that situation has led her to spend her nights going to bars pretending to be drunk and getting revenge on the men who try to take advantage of her. What are you doing? So before I get into any specifics, I will say that this movie obviously deals with some pretty heavy subject matter. It has comedic aspects, but don't go into this movie expecting something light. It's a very dark comedy revenge thriller in which someone is willing to destroy themselves to enact that vengeance. There's nothing overly graphic throughout the movie, but there is a scene at the end that will be very hard for some people to watch. And it seems like it's an incredibly divisive movie, even amongst my own friends and mutuals. But as long as you go into this movie knowing what it is and what to expect, I think you'll have a better time. I'm not saying you'll love it or even enjoy it, but I think the framing will help. It's fine if you wish the story was something else by the time it gets to the end, but I do think it does what it set out to incredibly well. It also has an incredible soundtrack loaded with all sorts of pop music that people often want to dismiss. We got Fletcher, Muna, Paris Hilton, and a Britney Spears cover, 10 out of 10. And I really enjoyed the movie as a whole. I've seen it three times now, and the more I watch interviews with Emerald Fennell and Carrie Mulligan, the deeper that appreciation gets. But this is not a movie where you should necessarily be looking up to the main character. This isn't really intended to be a full-on female empowerment movie, though it does deal with that. You're not supposed to walk away from this movie wanting to be Carrie Mulligan's character, like beyond the delivery and confidence. Her revenge is far more centered on psychological torture than anything violent, but again, she's quite literally willing to destroy her life in the process, even scaring herself with her actions at times. Overall, very heavy subject matter, very unsettling, but so many times you'll find yourself on the edge of your seat, just fully on board as Carrie Mulligan owns her sardonic humor with the people around her. One of the funniest moments that's also super sinister that's in the trailer was her moment with McLovin where he keeps trying to defend that he's a nice guy, but he literally doesn't remember her name. What's my name? But hey, at least he didn't try to take advantage of her when he thought she was asleep. He wakes her up first. You do get points for that. But then as the story builds, the layers of the tragedy and her grief start to unwind. Which contributes to why we only want the best for this character who is so often making choices we wish were different. I'm now gonna talk about what specifically happened to fuel her evening activities. So if you really wanna go in completely blind, this is where you should hop on, but it's gonna be a little while before we go full spoilies. Cassie has been dealing with the grief of the loss of her lifelong best best friend, who ended her life following the events of an assault that happened at the hands of one of her fellow med school classmates at a party. But it's her inability to deal with that grief and live a life without Nina that sparks her into action. And every time you think you know where this story is going, it's gonna do something to pull the rug out from under you. But unlike what some people seem to be trying to say, this movie is not trying to send forth the message that all guys are monsters, or that only men can commit horrible acts. It's just pointing out that a lot of people that think they're nice are actually not that nice at all. I know Fennel specifically used a variety of bars and clubs in an any town America setting to just show that this stuff happens to anyone, anywhere, and there's no excuse for it. And you'll come to see that it's not just men caught in Cassie's vengeance. This is something so entrenched in our culture and there are a lot of ways that it's maintained by our society. No one really comes out of this movie looking good. Nobody comes out of this movie very well, and including Cassie. So this movie has no reason to be preoccupied necessarily with the good deed 
needs that we all do. This movie is in service of a story, so it doesn't need to pander to the people that are like, well, I don't do that, because like, good for you, you've done the bare minimum. We're all used to the revenge story and even the female revenge story, but Fennel wanted to subvert some of those genre expectations and make this more about the psychological. Specifically saying that she felt most female revenge stories involve women not really acting in the way women would expect, so she tried to imagine how she'd go about dealing with this situation. And this isn't the only piece of media that was released in 2020 that's taken a look at the effects of sexual assault and how it's infiltrated various areas of our society as told from the perspective of women. There was the slow burn film The Assistant by Kitty Green that looked at power abuse in executive positions. The fantastic series I May Destroy You by Michaela Cole, a painfully real look at the many different ways people will process the things that happen to them and consent. But what Emerald Fennell did with Promising Young Woman is not the story of addressing grief in a constructive and healthy way. In fact, it's probably one of the least healthy ways someone could address these very real life situations. And that's okay, it's a genre film. Something can be a morality tale without having to handhold you through to some constructive answer. Because a lot of the times there aren't any. Our protagonist Cassie isn't wrong in her convictions or her judgments. Her anger is justified, but you will find yourself wishing things were different for her. While realizing that she is 100% doing things that are not okay. But her being grounded in this truth results in a loosely adapted avenging angel story. Where the characters she encounters either receive redemption or punishment punishment based on their actions. Largely, this is a story of redemption and forgiveness, it's just that you have to accept ownership of action to receive it. And it's okay if this just doesn't end up being the movie for you. Like I said, even amongst my own mutuals, it's been incredibly divisive. But I do think that if you go into this movie with the correct framing, expecting a revenge thriller, which our lead is going at her targets in a largely psychological way, often at the expense of herself, something that becomes a very dark character study versus a female empowerment or, you know, John Wick-esque massacre, I think you'll end up enjoying it a lot more. But let me know what you're thinking if you saw it, if you liked it, if you didn't, if you hated it, that's totally fine. Just try to keep things a little bit civil down there. But we'll now be getting into the specific events that happened in this movie and why it's so impactful, AKA spoilies. So the movie starts with a scene out of the trailer set to the Drollo remix pop track of Boys by Charlie XCX, as it pulls us into this white collar-ish bar. And this is where we see Cassie sprawled out in a very biblical way, being heavily judged by these guys around the bar until the seemingly kind one of the group, played by Adam Brody himself, heads over to help her home. And this is going to subvert us in a couple ways. For one, he seemed like the respectful one of the group, and two, for those unfamiliar with his role in Jennifer's body, you might be lulled into a false sense of well-intentioned sarcasm due to his time as Seth on the OC. Because what starts as trying to get her home quickly becomes getting her to his home without any prompting on her end. This builds us to the scene I showed earlier. He kisses her with no reception, making moves on her even though she says she feels unwell, keeps repeating that she's safe because in some way I think he really believes that. And then she flips it. She should be terrified, but it's her conviction in her mission that allows her not to feel that fear, which terrifies them even more. Then in what has to be my favorite scene of the movie, she's walking home and it looks like there's blood dripping down her leg and then it pans up to her eating a hot dog and it's just ketchup dripping. And that again immediately subverts the expectation people had that she'd be killing these guys every night. She's just making them painfully aware that they're not the people they think they are. And it's such a badass opening until it shows exactly how much this has taken over her life. She has a book filled with names she's done this to and it's clearly been years of activity. And while there's nothing wrong with living at home to save money or working at a coffee shop, it's clear that the people around her expected more of her life. Her mom comments that she hasn't been the same since she and Nina dropped out of med school and that she's out all night but has no friends and they clearly clearly have some issues that she's still at home. This is made very obvious when her birthday gift is a suitcase. Is it a nice suitcase at least? It's definitely the fanciest get the fuck out of our house metaphor I've received so far. At this point, the closest thing she has to a friend in her life is her boss, Gail, played by the always fantastic Laverne Cox. Random fun fact, she's reading a book called Careful How You Go, which is the title of Emerald Fennel's debut short film that also premiered at Sundance. And this is where we get Bo Burnham's Ryan, someone that she had actually gone to med school with. Why are you working here? Or, I didn't mean to. <laughs> Which is a horrible way to ask that, but it's apparently because she used to be at the top of her class and then just disappeared. But there's the awkward back and forth because he realizes he just deeply offended her. You can spit in it if you want. I, I deserve that. 
and she actually does it. Normally this would just be some kind of comedic diffuser, but Cassie doesn't give a shit. And he's just so enamored by her gumption that he asks her out on a date. Because nothing is more romantic than a girl spitting in your coffee. Seriously, I just spat in your coffee. But that night she's right back to business, watching a beauty guru on how to do the perfect looking blowjob lips before purposely making it look sloppy. Other fun fact, that YouTuber is actually the director. And enter McLovin. But why are you wearing all that makeup? Do you mind me asking? It's like guys don't even like that kind of stuff, you know? And he ultra freaks out when he realizes she's sober, still tries to maintain that he's a nice guy. So she points out that every week she goes to a club, pretends to be drunk, and every week she's right back in the same spot. You wanna fuck me still? No, thank you, man. No one ever does. But Ryan is persistent because she gave him the wrong number and he still comes back around to see what's up. And then I sent that text to an oil rig worker called Red. And he says, hey, if you're not into it, that's fine. I'll stay away, but... I can't stop thinking about you spitting in my coffee. See, ladies, if you're into guys, coffee spitting is flirting. And after a rocky conclusion to the first date where he was like, oh, wow, look, it's my apartment. Yeah, I feel like I fucked this up. No, it's not you. She actually genuinely enjoys their time together and starts getting happy again. Gail is giving him the third degree about killing children because he's a pediatric surgeon. It's perfect. But the danger of them dating is that it pulls her back into the life she left behind. He's confused as to why she dropped out because she was so far ahead of everyone in class. And when he brings up someone named Al Monroe, that sets her off. And he's getting married. I know, God help her. <laughs> this is where the full scope of her life trajectory is revealed. How she lost Nina, her lifelong friend, as a result of something that Al did. And finding out that he's back in the country causes her to put a much larger revenge plan into motion. And just like her evening conquest, her plan will be executed with tally marks. And this is Mark 1. So she plans to meet up with a former classmate named Madison, played by Allison Brie. And before she shows up, Cassie sets Madison up with champagne and ginger ale for herself, which is the classic business tip of get the target drunk while you stay sober. <laughs> and then once she's thoroughly lit, Cassie flips the questions. I wanted to talk to you about why I dropped out. And we find out that Madison pretty much puts the blame on Nina for what happened. She comments that if you have a reputation for sleeping around, what do you expect? Complete victim blaming that will become way more concerning once the movie continues. Sorry, for your sake, I was hoping you'd feel different by now. Then Cassie pays a guy at the bar to take the now very drunk Madison up to her room. Just remember what I told you earlier about Cassie being all about the psychological. Mark two is Dean Walker. Cassie pretends that she wants to resume her education, but then starts trying to find out if the Dean remembers anything about what happened to Nina and why they dropped out. Which she doesn't, but she does remember Al. So Cassie tells the Dean all about what Al did to Nina, how he took advantage of her in front of all of his friends while she was too drunk to know what was happening, repeatedly, how she had bruises all over her body. Do you know who Nina spoke to? You. So she tries to spin it. It was Nina's fault for making the choice to be that drunk. These things just happen and she probably looked into it thoroughly at the time. Then she asks if Nina is okay. No. She's not. But Al Monroe is. And whoopsie, forgot to mention that Cassie manipulated the Dean's daughter into waiting for her favorite band at a local diner, but tells the Dean that she dropped her off with the guys that now live in Al's old room. So she of course wants to know which one. I told you, I don't remember that. Well, that's a shame. And after a thorough freak out, she finally admits she was wrong. I guess it feels different when it's someone you love. So Cassie tells her that she's safely at a diner and that she should go get her because she'll probably never realize that the band isn't coming. She's kind of an idiot, huh? Who needs brains? They never did a girl any good. That scene, holy shit. And this should have been the indication that this movie wasn't just a blatant hit piece on men. It's a movie that shows the many systems in place that allow these behaviors to continue. Hundreds of thousands of these assaults don't get dealt with properly at the college level because the school just wants to sweep it under the rug. Friends want to make excuses for behavior. But we're starting to see the toll this is taking on Cassie. She is slumped over in her car after this meeting and then this guy starts to yell at her so she smashes the hell out of his truck. And this is normally where the hero would walk off in a blaze of glory, but she kind of immediately realizes that she f***ed up and could get arrested. <sighs> and at this point she's blown off a date with Ryan because she was late and forgot about it because she's been so obsessed with this revenge plot, but then he ends up seeing her out later that night on one of her ventures. Ventures that are gaining some notoriety. I'm not the only one who does this. There's a woman in the city that carries a pair of scissors. 
but the true mission must continue. Mark III is the lawyer. I'm afraid it's your day of reckoning. I've been waiting. And while he doesn't know who she is, he has been waiting for the day that someone would show up to hold him accountable. You see, this is a defense lawyer, one who specifically made a career out of bullying victims to drop their cases, the man who bullied Nina into dropping hers. Even when he knew his clients were guilty, which I get is his job, but is disgusting. And while he doesn't remember the last name, he does remember that her name was Nina based on the very minimal description of events. Nina? It was Nina, though, wasn't it? And this throws Cassie off. Of everyone, she assumes he'd have the least compassion and remorse. He starts talking about how they'd get bonuses for any trial that was thrown out, how it was someone's job just to comb through social media. One drunk photo at a party. Oh, you wouldn't believe how hostile that makes a jury. And he actually wants her to do something to him because he hasn't been able to sleep because of the guilt. So she forgives him. I'm so sorry. Go to sleep. And that's what it takes to get the redemption from our avenging angel. Do I go in now? No. So she goes to visit Nina's mom, another iconic actress, Molly Shannon. And she's begging Cassie to stop what she's been doing. I don't even think she knows the full scope. She just knows Cassie won't let it go. That she isn't living her life and she knows it won't do her any good and it can't help Nina. Which reveals another piece of the puzzle. Cassie blames herself because she wasn't at the party. That she wasn't there to protect Nina. But Cassie not living her life is probably what would upset Nina the most. To know that her worst moment also derailed her best friend's life would be horrible. And it's after this conversation and her chat with the lawyer that makes her willing to abandon her plan. She throws out her book, deletes her stalker account, and goes to make up with Ryan. Oh, great, it's you. But he does come around pretty fast. Do you want to go to dinner, you miserable asshole? And everything seems perfect. The movie becomes a genuine rom-com. They dance to Paris Hilton in a convenience store and everything. She takes him to meet her parents. They're falling in love. And her parents are just so happy that she's starting to live her life again. Nina was like a daughter to us. We really miss her. But God, we have missed you. But then Madison shows up on her doorstep begging for answers. And for those who were concerned, no, nothing happened to her. Cassie is terrifying, but she wouldn't get vengeance by putting someone in the same situation. Not that what she did do was remotely okay. He didn't touch you. But the mental stress gave Madison some time to think, and she ended up finding a video on one of her old phones, the video of Nina being assaulted, which had been passed all around their class. I don't know how we all could have watched it and, um, what? thought it was funny. And for those who don't deal well with that kind of content, they don't ever show the video, just her reaction to it. And then she sees something that breaks her heart and punches the audience in the gut. Ryan was at the party and saw it happen. The first person she lets back in was involved in the situation that derailed her life. So moving on is out the window. She immediately goes to find Ryan. He says he doesn't remember, and I'm kind of sadly inclined to believe him, but she basically blackmails him to get the location of Al's bachelor party. And he starts freaking out when she won't guarantee that she won't spread the video around. And then we both won't be doctors, you fucking failure. And this hurts the audience almost as much as Cassie. This is also the moment where some people were like, see, she is saying that all guys are bad, which really isn't what she's saying at all. Look, I love men. I think they're absolutely, they're true. Ryan isn't this completely evil person that's had the wool pulled over her eyes the entire time. While he's dead to her regardless, and he was culpable in a situation without taking part, he could have redeemed himself a bit. He could have shown some remorse here, but didn't. And Bo specifically said this character is one of the many examples that people don't have to be bad to their core to be culpable. So it's time for Mark IV, where we get the fantastic string cover of Toxic by Britney Spears. <laughs> She gets to the bachelor party by pretending to be a stripper, drugs everyone, and gets Al alone in a room, handcuffs him to a bed saying it's for her safety, and he doesn't really want to be a part in it. He's a changed man. You might be surprised to hear that gentlemen are sometimes the worst. So he just tries to make some small talk until she says her name is Nina Fisher. And he actually remembers Nina and thinks his friend Joe set it up to mess with him, but freaks out when he realizes who she really is. You're Nina's friend! So you did notice me after all. Then freaks out even more when he realizes that she has the video evidence. The thing is, you thought you'd gotten away with it because everyone had forgotten. Top of her class, and she dropped out. I did too, to take care of her. And that's the reason she dropped out, to help Nina, because she went from this vibrant, amazing individual to a shell. And he can't even bring himself to say what he did. I want you to tell me what you did. Are you, 
Are you talking about? What do you think I'm talking about? And Fennel specifically said that the takes where he actually said the word that YouTube doesn't like, they felt insincere. That someone who committed that act wouldn't be able to use the word about their own actions because they wouldn't want to think of themselves in that way. So Cassie decides that because the last months of Nina's life were covered by Al, he should have her name all over him. So she goes to carve Nina's name into his chest and he breaks one arm free. And this is where the movie takes the turn that a lot of people aren't okay with. This is a very heavy and difficult scene to watch where Al smothers her. And we see that she's not some superhero. He is stronger than her. Fennel specifically said that it was important for her that the second Cassie brought a weapon into the situation, the reality that she's not trained to fight off someone twice her size would come into play. And no, this isn't what we want for Cassie. That's why this is so tragic. Then in a scene that could have been right out of a hangover movie with different framing, Joe, the guy who filmed the video, comes into the room and thinks he's lying about killing the stripper. You killed the stripper at your bachelor party? What is this, the 90s? <laughs> now, why is the fucking stripper dead? Well, how did this happen? <laughs> and he's immediately, without asking any questions, like, This is not your fault. I don't know, it kind of seems like it is. But Joe keeps trying to reaffirm to him that it's an accident and no one's gonna find out because they're just gonna get rid of the body. And how daring for a movie to play out its final 15 minutes without the only character we've been following the entire runtime. So they burn her body, her parents report her missing, and I feel so bad for them to get a glimpse of their daughter back and just because she was prepared to lose everything, it doesn't mean they were prepared to lose her. But she was prepared. A detective goes to talk to Ryan and this would have been his chance to say that he knew exactly where she went that weekend, but instead he just implies that she might have been in a mental position to hurt herself. Dick. And then it's the wedding day. Everything seems great. Joe doesn't have a care in the world and Ryan finally realizes how much of a creep he actually is. But then he gets a scheduled message from Cassie's phone that says, you didn't think this was the end, did you? And yes, yeah, some logic here might get iffy, but she sent a package to the lawyer with the phone that has the video, all the info and instructions to go to the police if she disappears. And then you hear the sirens close closing in as Mark V is complete. She leaves her half of the heart necklace to Gail. The police find the ashes of her body. Al gets arrested. They'll likely catch Joe too, and they may not fully answer for what they did to Nina, but they'll get a hell of a lot worse for not reporting Cassie is dead. And the cops now have the video, so who knows what else might happen. But that's the end. And it's certainly not an ending that some people wanted, and there was a clear way to make this the easy crowd pleaser. But Fennel commented that people have seen that movie, and it's endings like this that make movies truly memorable. For better or for worse, if you loved it or hated it or found it distasteful. And you often find your closest friends just don't agree with you on stuff. And mm. that's like, that's what you want. You want something to be thrilling and engaging, but also to like poke you in a way that makes you want to talk about it at least. You don't want to leave a movie and be like, okay. It wasn't a suicide mission, but Cassie went into that situation knowing that the worst could happen. And I was shocked that they committed to this ending. That was literally like my last note from Sundance. That's a gutsy ending. Regardless of what so many people wanted, because we all wanted the best for Cassie. She committed to that ending, giving Cassie the last word in the most horrific way. And to round it out, I like this quote from Carrie Mulligan about the movie. The other day, someone said, yeah, but is she just crazy at the end? Has the grief driven her mad? Responding that the point is that we have countless films about men who go on crusades on behalf of their loved ones, and we never say they're crazy or that they've lost their minds from grief. They're going around having shootouts and ninja fights in every scene. That is objectively insane. What Cassie's doing by comparison is fairly mild. It's just an interesting reaction because there's a huge amount of logic actually to what she's doing. Again, doesn't mean it's healthy, doesn't mean you have to enjoy what happened, but I do think that the discourse around the movie's been interesting to say the least. One thing I will say is that I don't think you'll ever be bored during the runtime. It's such a tough subject and some people may feel like it lacked empathy going into the end in favor of a gotcha moment, but this is the story that Emerald wanted to tell and I'm glad she was given the platform to do it exactly the way she wanted to. But that's going to do it for today's video. Make sure to let me know what you're thinking in the comments down below. Thanks as always to my patrons. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.